Hi, Helen. So why don't we start with sort of quite an uh, open general question. Uh, you spent quite a lot of time in your professional life doing science communication. What first led you to that? So I, it's not a very good way to start, but I'm going to disagree with the premise of your question because I hate the term science communication. Right. I think it should never be, never be seen or used ever again. Uh, we don't have philosophy, you know, with history communication or arts communication. We have historians and artists who talk about what they do. Right. And I don't think that science is any different. I think if you're a scientist and you're a good communicator, you can share science. Um, but I think that sort of putting it in a separate category is actually quite damaging because it says, oh, science is over there and it's weird and only special people get to understand it. Right. And then it has to kind of be interpreted. And right. we don't do that for other things in life. Why do we do it for science? However, it is true that I spent a lot of time talking about science as a working scientist. And um, to some extent, it's just I'm interested in ideas and I'm interested in sharing ideas and I don't see why everyone shouldn't share in the ideas. So, and I, I think that's important. And I also think that this perception that science is, um, you know, for people in white coats who are very serious and who are sort of unraveling the mysteries of the universe. I mean, I think that's all very po-faced and useless, basically. It, first of all, ignores the fact that science is done by humans and that, you know, obviously we are trained and we aim to be objective, but you can't separate the way you look at the world from who you are. You know, so, so the kinds of scientific questions that get asked and the way in which they're answered, of course, there's a cultural bias. And, and I think you have to acknowledge that science is done by humans. It doesn't take away from the quality of the science, but it is something that should be acknowledged. And I think that, you know, sharing the fun things is one of the joys of life. And I think that sharing interesting ideas and curiosity is one of the joys of life. And so talking about science and sharing the perspective that it gives is really important. You know, there's this perception that... Um, science is all about facts and that's also nonsense uh, for some you know sort of philosophical reasons as well but but really what you have as a scientist is perspective you've got all these bits of knowledge that you've learned and you've built a worldview from them and you can share the perspective without always sharing all those bits of information yeah I mean, so one of the important things, I, I guess, about taking away this idea that uh, science is only for a stratified group of people, unlike the rest of us, that's going to be very important as we, you know, move into the immediate emergency of taking serious action on climate change. Do you think there's anything that we could be doing better in the UK, both through our formal institutions and also through the media, um, to, to enable people to be involved in that sense? Well, I think it's important to say you don't need to know any science to be involved in climate action, right? Because it's, a, it's again, it's a perspective thing. It's a, it's a what's your view on the world? Mm -hmm. And of course, you're going to need the advice of technical people who've looked at all the details and you know exactly how does a car work, exactly how does a bike work? You, of course, you need technical expertise. But I think addressing climate change is far more about what kind of world do I want to live in? How do I want to see myself as a citizen of planet Earth? Right. Do I want to just be part of this kind of one-way stream that pretends it can take stuff from over here, use it for three seconds, and then throw it and it just goes away, away over there? You know, do, do I want to be part of that train track, which is clearly not part, not the how nature works? Or do I want to look at the natural world and say, you know what, it's been here for four and a half billion years, all these atoms are going round and round all the time. There is no alternative to recycling. None. Everything basically is made from poo. I mean, that's, that everything is made from waste material. Right. All of it right, was something right. else before. And so you don't need to know, you know, a huge number, amount of detail about the carbon cycle or about plastics waste to understand the difference between just funneling stuff to somewhere over there that you pretend is called away because right, of course right, it isn't right, away right. it's all connected yeah. or whether you acknowledge that this everything goes round and round you know we just so i think you can take the ideas without the science now of course the science trusting the science is important because basically climate science is like a, a flight simulator for a planet it lets us say if we do this what will happen further down right. the line and just like when a pilot is learning to fly a plane you don't want them to make their mistakes with a real plane full of people, yeah. you know, with the, the what with how we treat the climate, we can't afford to make the mistake with the one planet we've got. So we need the flight simulators to practice on. But then we have to trust the science that comes out of them. And there are good re there is a huge amount of very robust science that goes into that. And and we do need to take seriously what comes out. You know, if we don't stop emitting fossil fuels, we have some very serious consequences down the line. So, so there does need to be some trust in science, which comes along with understanding how science works. 
so science education is part of it is what I'm saying, but it's not necessary. Like we can't wait to solve climate change until everyone has a degree in science because right. it's just not going to happen. Gonna, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, turning to your, your scientific research, what in your career has been something that you've worked on that you think has, is going to be most profoundly affecting for climate change? Well, the thing about climate science and the earth science, you know, earth system science is that all of it's important. And I know that's kind of a glib answer, but one of the problems of the world is that we're like, what's the shiniest thing? What's the best thing? What's the most important thing? And sometimes you need that perspective. But actually, the, the reason that, that science works is that loads of people are doing all the little things. Everyone's putting a brick, right? right? And then eventually you have a building. And you can't say if that brick didn't exist, then the building would fall down. But you can say if there were no bricks, there would be no building. Yeah. So, you know, the science that I work on is to do with um, how the ocean basically takes a deep breath at sea during a big storm. And it's to do with the breaking waves and bubbles. And the things that I do involve measuring what's really going on. You know, seafarers have looked out over stormy seas for centuries but they couldn't see what was happening 10 centimeters below the surface. And, right. and that's because the surface is moving up and down by 10 meters. You know, it's yeah. enormously difficult to get at. So my work is associated with like what's happening in there. But I understand that's just one brick. Yeah. And, and it's always like that. You know, we talk about geniuses and these big ideas, but really everyone is only ever putting a brick. And yeah. sometimes you might, get, you might have a particularly exciting or shiny brick, but it's all just another brick, right? So we're all part of it. It's, I, I, so I don't have this sort of hierarchical view of this part of science was more important than this part, partly because, you know, there's papers I wrote 12 years ago that no one cared about. Right. And then suddenly there's some new industry has come up and they're like, oh, that's what right. we need to know, right? right? So, so I'm not really on board with this kind of ranking past pieces of science because we don't know, that's yeah. the point. They're all yeah. there waiting for it to be useful. Yeah, brilliant. So um, moving on to the sort of the, the sociology of the practice of science, you've spoken before about the importance of diversity in the people who are trained as scientists, practicing sciences. What, what is the importance of diversity? Why, why, why should that be such an important thing to champion? So it comes back to that thing about science being about perspective. You kind of need two things. You need the basic building blocks of knowledge to know where you're going, but then you need, the perspective is like the shape of the house, right? right. So, and everyone's experience is their own sort of set of bricks, right? Their own set of where their experiences came from. So they see the world slightly differently. They take the perspective built by all those bits of knowledge and they shape it slightly differently based on their experiences. Mm -hmm. And so you get different questions depending on what shape you build. And that's what diversity is fundamentally. Right. I mean, it comes in two forms. One is that you want the best ideas in the room. And that means you don't want 50 people who have exactly the same idea because they've built their knowledge house in exactly the same way. What you want is people who've taken the same bits of information, built them into 50 different things, and they've all got 50 different ways of asking the next question. So, so one part of it is that these are big, serious things to address, and we need all the ideas we can get. And of course, the other part of it is that we, humanity, is a team. We don't always behave like it, <laughs> but we're all on the planet together, and this is all we've got. And so, um, we need to feel like we're part of that team yeah. and we need to feel that people like us are in the room when things are discussed and we need to feel that you know somebody who lives my kind of life on my kind of street was in the room when they decided whether or not cars were allowed or bikes were allowed or there was going to be a new bus route right. um, and a lot of this is going to come down to like little nitty-gritty stuff yeah. like that yeah. and so that that feeling part of a team feeling like people like you of a part of this that's what you need to bring everyone on board to do yeah. it together so it so it kind of comes in two two flavors yeah absolutely so then in with regards to the practice of science and the institutions that are involved universities and i suppose educational institutions all the way up the age brackets um what, what are sort of some concrete practices we could be working on to to achieve this diversity in practicing scientists it comes it happens all the way along. I think one of the difficulties with diversity in science at the moment is that because there's a long kind of conveyor belt of where people go, everyone can always blame everyone else on the conveyor belt, right? right? Universities right. can say, oh, well, not enough students applied. Schools can say, oh, well, these students don't think they're wanted over there. You know, everyone can blame everyone else. Yeah. So the, the first, the most important thing is that we've got to stop blaming everyone else. And 
And I think, and this is generally true for, for a lot of climate questions, is everyone's like, oh, well, they didn't do a thing. And it's the most destructive and time-wasting thing possible, right? Mm -hmm. Never mind them. Like, fine, vote or protest or something if you can change what they're doing. But the most important thing is you change what you can do in your bit of it. So, so for example, um, just listening to people is the most important thing. You know, if, some, if someone comes into a room and perhaps they don't feel quite comfortable because no one else looks like them or no right. one else is their age or whatever it is, the one thing everyone can else do is actually listen to them before they start talking. And, and in a way, that's the, the most important sort of opening step to diversity. Because if people, because if you want to welcome people in, if you don't listen to them, how are you going to know whether they feel welcome or not? How are you going to know, you know, whether something you just said offended them in a way you didn't know that you could learn about, you right. could do better next right. time. So I think, the, you know, in terms of concrete steps, I think it really does start there. Like, if you want people in the room, go and find them where they are and listen to their ideas about why they're not in your room and then right. do something about it. Right, right. And so to, to, to ask a slightly more biographical question, what were your early experiences with science that led you to pursue the career that you've pursued? So I was very fortunate in the sense that I had parents who were... Um, neither of them thought of themselves as particularly bright or well-educated, but they weren't afraid to ask questions. Right. So if I, when I was a kid, you know, and I would say, what's that do? And they would say, oh, I don't know. Let's go to the library and find out. Let's go and look in a book. Right. Let's plant it and see what grows. And I think, you know, m almost more than any of the formal education I got, growing up with that was really important. Eventually, my mum said to me, well, I don't know. You go off to university and get a degree and then come back and tell me. <laughs> uh, I think she possibly didn't appreciate quite how far that was going to go. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, but that sort of, so, so they, they weren't, they, they never said, oh, you're not supposed to ask that or I haven't got time to answer it. Right. Or, they, they're busy, they were busy parents. I'm sure sometimes they did say, I haven't got time to do that now. Um, but the other thing is they just said, do your best. They didn't ever say, Oh, we're going to be disappointed if you don't get an A or we're going to, you know, like we have expectations. They just said, do your best. Mm. And that was one of the most empowering things, I think, that I never felt under pressure to do well. And I did, if you look at my exam results, do very well. But I had the freedom to do very well because no one was like shoving me. Right, right. And, and so that thing of, you know, you do your best and that's enough. And I think that in life, you know, that's all you can do, right? You, you, you have to try, but you can do your best. And when you've done your best, you have to say, well, that was what I did, yeah. and that's all right. So, the, and in a sense, there's a much wider lesson here, um, which is, you know, fostering a supportive space for an for a curiosity that one hopes will be there anyway um, is really the key. And that, I suppose, goes for people who will become interested in science and maybe become formally trained scientists or anyone mm. else, really, who, yeah, who does and anything I, else. I think one of the things, and my dad used to it used to embarrass me as a kid, but I would t I don't have children, but if I did, I would totally do it now. Is he would just sort of you know, one drop people and say, what's that then? You know, or someone, or I'd, or I'd say, oh, there's this person over there and I really admire them. And he'd just, want, he'd just toddle up to them and say, oh, you know. And, um, and I, I was so afraid of um, imposing myself on the world in being where I wasn't wanted. I, I felt I had to justify my existence. Like I knew I could do things, but I wasn't confident about walking into a space unless I knew somebody wanted me to be doing that thing. Right. Right. Um, and and I think when you see people who are just not afraid to just walk into situations and go, oh, hello, who are you? <laughs> you know, that those those little things. And I think it, especially in the diversity, a lot of a lot of it is self censorship, but it's not unreasonable self censorship. It's because they've seen what happens when other people do that and it doesn't go well. Yeah. And and actually, the lesson is you don't know unless you try. Yeah. You know, you walk up to 10 people, maybe nine of them are rude to you. One of them might be nice. Yeah. And it's not that you should have to suffer through the nine, but it's that if you if it's just like water off a duck's back a bit, if you, well, that's an idiot. I don't want to talk to them anyway. You give yourself a better chance of getting somewhere interesting. And it's it's finding ways to show people that it's OK to fail before they succeed. Considering you're here with us at How the Light Gets In, um, and people have come to watch you speak and debate and be involved in this event, have you had anyone come up to you like like you said that your father used to do and say, 
oh, you know, I just want to talk to you about your work. Oh, like, w w what did you mean when you say this? <laughs> um, well, I don't know. My partner's in the green room doing it right now, I think, to all <laughs> the speakers. <laughs> so you brought, you brought someone to the festival who's <laughs> yeah, doing that. So he's right. off doing that while I'm doing giving talks. Um, no, so there were, and actually it was very interesting. There were, so I gave a, a school's talk this morning about the ocean and most of the people in that room were humanities, uh, you know, sort of slightly on the humanities side, which is fine. But what was interesting is they were then t teaching me about the philosophy of ancient Greece and the history of, um, you know, civilizations in the past that have had various relationships with the ocean. So I told them what I thought about the ocean. Right. And then they came up to me and said, oh, I've got questions about that. But then there was this like tribe in ancient Greece that had a particular, I don't know, the uh, Philistines or someone had a particular relationship with the ocean. Right. And so the point is that they, fine, they came to ask me a question, but I also learned something from it. So that's the great thing about these festivals, isn't it? That going up to talk to the speakers afterwards is always the, the most interesting thing. But I'm learning as well in a lot of those cases. That's the important thing to, to say. Well, good. Hopefully that's a sign that it's working because I think the idea is that everyone learns from everyone else, audience and speakers alike. Brilliant. Um, well, thank you very much for coming, Helen. You're very welcome. Thank you. Nice to talk.